Welcome back, everyone. I'm Jordan Giesegi, and this is The Limiting Factor. Over the past couple of years, I've increasingly emphasized that over the next decade, Tesla will need a huge amount of raw materials to produce battery cells if they want to continue growing at 50% per year. We're now hearing the same from Tesla. In the past few months, Elon said publicly and in earnings calls that the limiting factor for Tesla is battery cell production, and the limiting factor for battery cell production is battery materials. Today, I'm going to walk you through why battery materials are such a challenge, and broadly, what Tesla's strategy might look like to tackle that challenge. That is, in the past, I've only highlighted the challenges Tesla faces with securing the raw materials they need to produce battery cells. In this video, I'm going to explain how Tesla can wring every gram of material from an increasingly tight materials market and continue growing at 50% per year until 2025 and possibly beyond. I'm not saying that will happen and this isn't investing advice, but rather how that could be done. I'd like to reinforce that this video will be at the strategic level. What I'll be covering here is only the tip of the iceberg. There are hundreds of mines, dozens of mining and refining companies, many different ways to mine and refine each material, and lots of question marks around politics and regulation. It's also worth noting that Tesla's 2021 impact report contains great insights into how Tesla thinks about their supply chain. However, as the title indicates, the focus of the report is on impact, whereas this video is focused on how Tesla will develop their supply chain for batteries. Finally, a key assumption in this video is that factories to produce battery cells won't be Tesla's primary bottleneck. The cell factory that Tesla unveiled at Battery Day effectively eliminates that bottleneck if Tesla can ramp these factories, and I'm confident they will. Each of Tesla's battery cell lines will produce seven times more gigawatt hours per line than conventional battery cell lines. And so far, each factory Tesla has announced will produce at least 100 gigawatt hours of battery cells, which is the total amount of battery cells Tesla is currently using from all cell suppliers globally from a single factory. Before we begin, a special thanks to my Patreon supporters and YouTube members. This is the support that gives me the freedom to avoid chasing the algorithm and sponsors. As always, the links for support are in the description. I also want to thank RK Equity and Benchmark Minerals. Howard Klein and Rodney Hooper at RK Equity have answered a lot of my questions about the mining industry over the last couple of years. Benchmark Minerals has been beating the drum on battery materials for nearly a decade now, and I've used their slides in almost every video I've made. Neither RK Equity nor Benchmark Minerals are sponsoring this channel or reviewed this script. It's a matter of credit where credit is due. The content in this video is my own take that I've cobbled together from dozens of conversations, news, and my own insights. It should be viewed as a materials thesis 1.0 because I'm sure my views will develop as a result of the feedback on this video. On that note, if I get anything technically incorrect in the video, let me know in the comments below. Let's start with the materials challenge for scaling the production of lithium ion batteries. In recent videos, I've said that Tesla literally needs mountains of materials. Currently, global battery cell production is at a run rate of about 400 gigawatt hours per year. At Giga Berlin, Elon Musk said that about 300 terawatt hours of batteries will be required to transition the world to sustainable energy. I ran some back of the napkin math and to me, that looks like 1.5 billion tons of material in the next 20 years or so. That's 75 million semi-loads, which is about 10,000 semi-loads of material per day, on average, every day for the next 20 years. And that's refined finished product. Depending on the material, the amount of earth processed at mines and shipped around the world for refining will be 10 to 100 times greater. The finished product is just the tip of the iceberg. Currently, the global production of battery materials is at about 250 semi-loads of battery materials per day. This is what Elon means when he says Tesla is preparing for extreme scaling. We need to get from 250 semi-loads of material per day to 10,000 semi-loads of material per day of steady-state production, which is about 40 times current production. That leaves us with two questions. 
First, what proportion of the growth in the global battery material supply chain will go to Tesla? And second, will the world be able to ramp battery materials that quickly? Global battery cell production, and therefore material usage, increases by about 25% per year. Let's say that for the next few years, cell production and the materials to build those cells increases at 25% per year. If Tesla grows at 50% per year and the global battery material supply chain only grows by 25% per year, that means that Tesla would be consuming 50% of the world's battery supply by 2025 and 100% of the world's battery supply by 2028, which would mean a full global monopoly. Of course, that's not going to happen. Why? First, geopolitics. It would put the global energy infrastructure in the hands of a single company. Governments aren't going to allow that. But free market forces would hit the brakes on a Tesla monopoly on batteries well before that. Which brings us to point number two. The second reason Tesla won't control 100% of the battery material supply is that it's not in the best interest of mining companies or their shareholders to be completely dependent on one battery cell manufacturer. As a result, many companies aren't willing to sell Tesla the majority of their output. This is especially true of established battery materials companies, which are usually only willing to supply about 40% of their output to one company, and at most 50%. There are exceptions, but that's generally the case. But all this assumes that the world will be able to ramp the global battery materials supply chain quickly enough to support a growth rate of 50% per year for Tesla, plus every other auto manufacturer. Note that the image on screen doesn't include auto manufacturers that aren't part of a conglomerate like BYD and Tesla. Can the battery materials supply chain support all these concurrent ramps? That's a hard no. This image shows that starting this year, battery material shortages will begin to kneecap the growth of the EV industry, and by 2025, EV producers will only be getting half of the battery materials they need. Benchmark Minerals data shows a similar situation. Of course, each analyst house comes to slightly different conclusions on different time frames. But overall, there's one undeniable message. Winter is coming. Let's do a quick recap of the battery materials challenge before we get into Tesla's strategy for building their supply chain. There are several converging pressures. First, the global battery material supply chain has only grown, on average, about 25% per year over the past couple of decades. Tesla is growing at 50% per year, which will naturally result in a bottleneck in the next few years if drastic action isn't taken. Second, the 25% figure I provided a moment ago was past tense. Current forecasts indicate that the battery material supply chain is forecasted to have relatively linear growth in the next decade rather than exponential growth. There simply hasn't been enough investment in the past 5 to 10 years to lay the groundwork for exponential growth at a global scale. Third, every other automaker wants to get battery materials for their vehicles at a time when shortages have already started. And, as I just said, those shortages will continue to get worse. That is, the cookie jar is already down to crumbs and there are only a few hands in it. What happens when about 70 other hands reach into the cookie jar? Fourth, as I've said in past videos, it only takes one material to trip up Tesla or any other manufacturer. All of these battery materials are potential icebergs, and given that all of them are ramping at different rates, each will probably have a turn at colliding with manufacturing ramps. Fifth, another thing I've covered a number of times in past videos is that it takes a minimum of five years to bring a mine online, with the average being much longer. The snags here are exploration, permitting, and funding. That is, it's not the mining facilities that's the bottleneck for mines in the long term, past 2025. It's politics, legal challenges, and bureaucracy. These things are all difficult to predict and often hit roadblocks. Some direct lithium extraction projects that operate on resources like geothermal brines in the Salton Sea may be an exception, but that would be the exception rather than the rule. However, those projects also pose other risks, which will be discussed briefly later in the video. If politics, legal challenges, and bureaucracy are such a significant bottleneck, why have Elon and Drew Baglino both pointed to refining as the primary bottleneck for battery materials, rather than permitting? 
Drew and Elon's comments were specific to lithium and cathode production, and on a time frame of about three years. Lithium refining is a very real challenge, but it's a technical challenge. I have faith in Tesla's ability to solve the refining challenge because Tesla excels at technical challenges. I'm focusing here on the strategy for the entire supply chain of every battery material needed, not just for lithium and for the rest of the decade. I'm also not saying that Drew and Elon are stuck on the technical and tactical, but rather my goal is to show you all the other things they're focused on that they haven't talked about. If they held our hand and walked us through all the minutia of everything they have on their plates, they wouldn't ever get anything done. But that's why I'm here doing my best to bridge the gap between what they know and what we know. If you're finding it helpful and useful, toss a coin to your witcher. There's a new tip button below and a link to Patreon in the description. As a side note, it's worth noting that I interpret Tesla's comments on refining as a positive sign, because it may mean that in the medium term on the mining front, that they anticipate having a huge amount of mined lithium lined up for processing from established resources. Moving along. So far, what I've covered above all sounds pretty dire for Tesla, and even more so for the majority of legacy automakers. I think for the latter, that's true, but for the former, it's an exciting challenge. Tesla is sitting on a mountain of cash. They've been working on their material supply chain for well over a decade, they have great engineers, and they have a culture and history of moving fast, even in the face of challenges. With all that out of the way, let's get into strategy. The first thing worth noting is that Tesla's challenge with battery materials will evolve through time, and Tesla will adapt as circumstances evolve. That is, I think there will be general guiding principles to Tesla's battery materials strategy, and their core of highly skilled engineers will take care of the tactics as the situation evolves. They're Tesla's field commanders. Tesla's become a beast, like a war machine that we haven't seen since World War II, and their primary challenge has become feeding the beast. That is, to get materials to the people on the front line so they can press on, fight battles, and take hills. Let's start with current state. At Battery Day, and in the subsequent six months, Elon said that nickel was the primary bottleneck Tesla is facing. However, the tone shifted quite a bit in the last few months, and now Elon is saying that lithium is the main focus. What happened here? From my perspective, four things. First, Tesla is rumored to be in talks with the world's number one future supplier of nickel, Indonesia. Indonesia and other Asia-Pacific countries are rich in a type of nickel called laterite. And, as we see in this image, most new future nickel supply is expected to be from laterite ores. This means Indonesia will go from producing about a quarter of the world's nickel today to nearly half by the end of the decade. However, nickel produced from laterite ores in the Asia Pacific and Indonesia is notoriously dirty and carbon intensive, which goes against Tesla's mission. What's going on here? If Tesla is signing agreements with Indonesia for laterite-based nickel, how can they justify it? Let's explore how Tesla could make these laterite mines work. Indonesia has stated they want to get away from exporting low-value raw materials and get into the higher-value side of the supply chain, which are refining and battery cell production. Guess who fantasizes about building material processing and battery cell production as close to the mine as possible? Elon Musk. I see the potential for a great match here between Tesla and Indonesia. Simply the act of vertically integrating near the mine will massively reduce the carbon emissions typically created when shipping materials around the globe for processing. Furthermore, if Tesla can provide oversight, engineering expertise, and or capital to clean up the mining and refining process, it may help reduce some of the negative climate and environmental effects from Indonesian nickel sourced from laterite ores. Tesla's already done something similar in New Caledonia, where they were a technical and industrial partner to Prony Resources on the Goro mine, which was previously owned, run, and productive under Vale, but ran into issues with profitability, sabotage, and environmental spills. As a technical partner, Tesla advised on product and sustainability standards at the mine, and the mine is now expected to roughly double its production output. That is, the goal for the Goro mine under Prony and with Tesla's influence is expected to produce more nickel at higher quality that's more environmentally friendly. 
Tesla now has the Prony Mine on their 2021 impact report and is assessing the environmental and social management systems. As part of the agreements Tesla signed with Prony at Goro, Tesla is expected to take most of the output of the mine. This is probably a basic supply agreement because Prony is taking on about $450 million of loans from the French government, and so it wouldn't be a streaming deal. What do I mean by a basic supply agreement versus streaming deal? By a basic supply agreement, I mean one where a supplier agrees to provide a certain volume of material in exchange for a fixed price or indexed price. Fixed price contracts are typically done outside of China by large established companies that want to guarantee their stakeholders a steadily increasing dividend over time. That is, they're optimizing for predictability of profits. With an indexed price contract, the contract price varies every month or quarter in reference to a market pricing index. The influence of the index price on the contract price can vary in strength. Chinese companies typically prefer this type of contract. It maximizes their potential gains, but does create exposure risks when prices are low. Of course, materials can be bought on the open market with no supply agreement if a supplier or purchaser wants to live dangerously, but that's less common. Roughly 30% of the lithium will be sold on the open market this year at the market prices shown on indexes. So when you see a chart like this, bear in mind that's not what most cell manufacturers are paying. It does influence some of the prices they pay, but they usually don't bear the full brunt of market swings. By a streaming deal, I mean a deal where Tesla or an intermediary would provide capital to get the mining operation going, and in return would secure future supply at a reduced cost. That could be either a fixed price or indexed price agreement. Moving along, the second reason why Tesla isn't shaking the trees for nickel is that battery day was 20 months ago now, or almost two years ago. Since then, Tesla shifted almost 50% of their vehicles to LFP. That gives Tesla a hell of a lot of breathing room on the nickel front. Furthermore, I expect that Tesla is open to signing further supply agreements for LFP battery cells with whatever company or companies can meet their criteria. For example, if Tesla can score agreements with not just CATL, but also with BYD, that will allow them to monopolize more of the existing and future cell supply. Eventually, Tesla wants to shift their battery supply to a 3 to 1 ratio of iron to nickel, or 75% iron and 25% nickel. Third, Tesla is signing agreements with smaller miners, including Talon Metals in Minnesota for nickel. Talon Metals is a junior miner. A junior miner is a miner that's in the process of developing a mine. Junior miners typically get acquired or seek out capital to remain independent and grow. Fourth, Tesla is rumored to have signed an agreement with Vale. We don't know how much nickel supply is involved here, but Vale intends to have about a third of their nickel output devoted to batteries over time. All right, that's a lot to take in, and that's only nickel and only on the short to medium term time horizon. There are half a dozen other materials needed to make battery cells, which all have their own dynamics in the short, medium, and long term. Short term in my definition being the next 24 months, medium term being two to four years, and long term being five years plus. The image on screen is the expected shortfalls in 2030. I'm not sure why rare earths are included, so you can ignore that. It would have been better if UBS included manganese instead. Regardless, given that Tesla's no longer sounding the alert on nickel, it sounds like they have nickel supplies lined up for a few years, despite an expected shortfall in the broader market in the next few years. Let's look at the strategic lessons Tesla's giving us from nickel. The first prong of Tesla's strategy is to sign agreements rather than buying out projects or companies. In particular, they're signing with laterite nickel mines in the Asia Pacific that aren't regarded as environmentally friendly. Although with a supply agreement they may not get 100% of the resources from a mine, it will limit public relations risks. However, despite the fact that Tesla is seeking to avoid public relations risks, that doesn't mean they aren't trying to do the best for the environment. Tesla is working directly with mines so they can monitor them more closely, as well as signing on as a technical partner. We don't know the extent of that technical partnership, but the word partnership indicates it may be more than just advisory. It may involve technology transfer, engineering support, and solar and or battery farms to improve the sustainability of the mines. 
This will allow them to get the best of both worlds. Limited involvement, limited PR risks, but huge amounts of nickel produced more cleanly. The second prong of Tesla's material strategy is a diversified cathode approach. This isn't limited to LFP and nickel chemistries, but also chemistries that contain varying amounts of manganese. That leaves lithium as the main concern with the cathode, which we'll come back to later. With regards to the anode, Tesla already gave us some of their strategy for anode materials on battery day. Tesla Silicon Tesla will use increasing amounts of silicon throughout the decade as they improve their silicon technology and become more comfortable with all the technology in the 4680 battery cell. As a side note, Tesla will need at least an order of magnitude more graphite anode by the end of the decade, so I'm not getting bearish on graphite. Pure graphite will be particularly important for long cycle life LFP. It's just that with Tesla silicon, they'll need less than the 30 or 40 times increase in material supply needed for materials like lithium. The third prong of Tesla's material strategy is a venture capital approach. The venture capital approach for Tesla is to place multiple bets on junior miners. This is low risk because Tesla will have a diversified portfolio of suppliers. But if one of the smaller mines does pan out, qualifies their material, and can expand quickly, it could go on to make up a larger portion of Tesla's material supply. Furthermore, when Tesla throws their weight behind these projects, it gives the projects credibility, attracts capital for funding, and encourages the development of other clean, locally sourced resources for Tesla's supply chain. The fourth prong of Tesla's strategy is to shift the supply chain away from China as much as possible because China has a virtual monopoly across the board. It's not in Tesla's best interest for one country to have complete power over its battery material supply chain. They need to diversify. Tesla will shift the supply chain away from China by localizing the supply chain in each country, such as possibly vertically integrating in Indonesia from nickel mine to battery line. And, as Elon and Drew advised on Battery Day, building a supply chain in North America with companies like Talon Metals. The fifth prong of Tesla's strategy is to bend the global supply chain towards batteries and EVs. Battery cell and vehicle production are now taking up a sizable portion of the global material market and will continue to grow. Vale, which typically supplies nickel for nickel plating and stainless steel, has taken note and intends to increase the proportion of its nickel sold to the EV market from 5% to 30-40%. to 40%. I'm not sure what proportion of that will be repurposed nickel supply and what proportion will be new supply coming online, but the heavyweight materials companies of the world are bending towards EVs, and in particular, Tesla. It should now be pretty clear why Tesla seems to have shifted their immediate focus away from nickel and towards lithium. Using the first five strategies I've just outlined, they may have a nickel runway in place for the next two to three years, and possibly up to four years or more. It all depends on the size of the agreements, the proportion of LFP and manganese cathodes they intend to use, the rate they ramp 4680 production, and whether all the agreements above actually pan out. But things are looking pretty solid. With multiple shots on goal, with so many suppliers, Tesla's in a great position and can shift their focus to the next material on their shopping list. Lithium. Lithium is a different animal than nickel. Most lithium comes from hard rock in Australia and brines in South America. However, lithium is concentrated in about everything, from seawater to clay. Most countries contain a huge amount of lithium. The resources just haven't been quantified and marked as reserves. Lithium from Australia and South America is usually shipped all the way to China for processing into refined battery-grade lithium. Then, that refined battery-grade lithium is shipped to other facilities in China and around the world and eventually becomes battery cells. The variety of resources that lithium can be extracted from and the current structure of lithium supply chains offers two opportunities. First, although all mining has an environmental impact, Lithium has a potential to be produced with much less environmental impact than nickel production. It can be extracted using direct lithium extraction technologies from clay and brines. The reduced environmental impact means that direct lithium extraction may have an acceptable public relations profile, and Tesla might be willing to bring lithium production in-house. 
The second opportunity is that Tesla can cut costs on logistics and reduce CO2 emissions by localizing lithium mining and refining to the country that the battery cells are produced in. Or, even better than localizing to the country, what if Tesla built their lithium hydroxide plant at the mine? Usually, lithium from mining and extraction processes is concentrated to about 6% before being sent off for refining. 94% of the material shipped is waste material. That's a lot of wasted energy, money, and CO2 emissions. Vertical integration on-site may open the door to process efficiencies that could save even more wasted energy, money, and CO2 emissions. For example, with a fully vertically integrated lithium clay extraction process, a concentrated lithium solution could be pumped directly from the mine to the lithium hydroxide plant. And the lithium hydroxide could be pumped directly to a cathode plant. Usually, the mine is thousands of miles from the hydroxide plant. And the hydroxide plant is thousands of miles from the cathode plant. Plus, the liquid solution usually needs to be dried for shipping. Drying a liquid is energy intensive, so energy costs could be saved in addition to the transport costs. This brings us to the question over whether, as Elon suggested on Twitter, Tesla will get into lithium mining and refining. Based on what I've seen in Tesla's patents that have emerged since battery day, Tesla is clearly prepared to get into mining. If you have any doubts about Tesla's ability to do this, check out my Tesla lithium clay patent video. This is the sixth prong of Tesla's strategy, which I'll call Tesla Becomes a Miner. By Tesla Becomes a Miner, I mean Tesla becomes the full owner-operator of a lithium mine, with Tesla employees running the mine. For me, the technical aspects of running and operating a mine are well within Tesla's abilities. However, I think Tesla will avoid this, if at all possible, due to the reputational and public relations risks of running a mine. However, I can also imagine a slightly safer scenario where Tesla buys a controlling stake in a mining company, but doesn't actually operate the mine. This could be a potential seventh prong of Tesla's material strategy, and I'll call this Tesla gets into the mining business. That is, Tesla becoming a miner and Tesla gets into the mining business both involve ownership by Tesla, but Tesla becomes a miner would actually mean Tesla employees working in mining and refining on site, whereas Tesla gets into the mining business wouldn't. If Tesla got into the mining business, it might give them access to a greater proportion of global battery material production than they might have access to with other types of deals but it would put Tesla one step closer to the public relations issues inherent in mining. It all depends on how badly Tesla needs those materials. If you'd like to know more about this, check out Howard Klein's video on the topic on the Rock Stock channel, where he walks through what the benefits might be if Tesla bought Albemarle. Moving on to the eighth prong of Tesla's battery materials strategy. Tesla buys cells from every cell manufacturer they can. As I said earlier, many battery material suppliers are only willing to provide Tesla up to 50% of their output. However, battery material suppliers can't dictate to battery cell manufacturers they sell to who their battery cells are sold to. This means Tesla can use their cell suppliers like LG Chem, Panasonic, and CATL as proxies to get the raw materials they need indirectly in the form of finished battery cells. This part of Tesla's strategy is already in play. Tesla already buys cells from multiple cell manufacturers because it's the lowest effort way to build their cell supply. No mining, no refining, no building cell factories. LG Chem, CATL, and Panasonic are providing Tesla with about 100 gigawatt hours of cells per year. However, because China has a near monopoly on battery materials, all these companies get most of their materials from supply chains that run through China, which still puts Tesla at the mercy of China. So, buying cells from other manufacturers is a good solution, but not perfect. More on this later. The ninth prong of Tesla's battery materials strategy is recycling. During Tesla's Q1 2022 earnings call, Drew Baglino said that Tesla is currently recycling 50 tons of batteries per week in Reno, and they're ramping to 150 tons. I assumed this to mean Redwood Materials, because Panasonic had an agreement in place with Redwood to recycle the scrap from Giga Nevada, which began in late 2020. However, Tesla's 2021 impact report just came out, and it confirmed that what Tesla is referring to here is actually the first stages of an in-house recycling process. 
This means my comments in the Q1 earnings call video about Tesla ramping recycling with redwood materials was likely incorrect. But there may be some gray area here. Panasonic indicated that Redwood was not only going to be doing recycling for Giga Nevada, but also develop processes that return lithium-ion battery materials from all sources, including consumer electronics. This may mean that Redwood was involved with Tesla's in-house recycling process. Regardless, in past videos, I did say that I expected Tesla to develop an in-house recycling process in the next few years. So, it's not that I didn't expect it to happen, it just happened far more quickly than I expected. If Tesla's replacing Redwood materials with their own recycling process, it may be a sign that it's at least as efficient as Redwood's. I don't see Tesla's competition to Redwood, I'm simply stating that Tesla's in-house recycling process already sounds quite effective, even at this early stage. They're already at 92% efficiency. What do I mean by that? For 1,000 kilowatt hours of end-of-life batteries, they can extract 921 kilowatt hours of battery materials. In the long run, Tesla is targeting a fully closed-loop recycling system where they recycle scrap from their factories as well as the batteries from battery packs that are end-of-life. How much of Tesla's supply chain will be made up of recycled material? It depends on the yield rate of their cell factories, which third-party suppliers like LG Chem are also recycling, what percentage of their battery packs are returned to them, how much recycled material they buy on the open market, and which chemistries can be recycled at high efficiency. But I'd say off the cuff, recycled materials will make up less than 15% of Tesla's materials supply. How do I arrive at that number? Generally, a vehicle will last at least 10 years, and Tesla has been growing at 50% per year. So, the cells from 10 years ago amount to about 2% of material supply. The scrap from Panasonic and Tesla's in-house lines will probably average out to about 7% scrap rate, and therefore about 7% of material supply. So, we're looking at 2% from Tesla battery packs, 7% from manufacturing scrap, and then we might expect 6% from recycling scrap on the open market. That number is taken from the image on screen by McKenzie and Company. In either case, the recycled material will probably scale roughly proportionally with their battery manufacturing efforts. That is, if my off-the-cuff estimate is correct, at most, 15 gigawatt hours of recycled material would be used per 100 gigawatt hours of battery cells in the long run. Finally, the tenth prong of Tesla's battery material strategy will be reducing CO2 emissions at every step of the manufacturing process. Why am I calling out CO2 emissions as a strategic factor? Because it will actually affect the choices Tesla makes when it partners with mines and chooses the materials that go into Tesla batteries. Tesla's mission statement is to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. Furthermore, it helps chip away at the argument that electric vehicles have a higher CO2 debt from their manufacturing phase than ICE vehicles. And finally, countries will increasingly implement taxes on CO2, like Europe's CO2 tariff, which will force manufacturers to either localize or minimize the CO2 emissions on imported products. Let's wrap up everything I've covered in this video to form a cohesive narrative about the size of the battery materials challenge and how Tesla might approach their battery materials strategy. First, the size of the challenge. The numbers are so huge that it's difficult to wrap your mind around them, so let's boil the numbers down into something more pragmatic. How should we view the raw materials challenge as investors? It's taken us well over 100 years to build a global economy based on fossil fuels. Now, we have to replace most of that while global energy consumption continues to grow exponentially. This means that no matter how many new mines come online of every type and how much refining capacity is built, it won't keep up with global demand growth for battery materials. Therefore, on a relative basis, if Tesla wants to maintain a 50% plus growth rate for battery cell and vehicle manufacturing, they'll have to eat the lunch of most of the potential competition in the EV market. And, on an absolute basis, the challenge for Tesla is to build or purchase as much new mining and refining capacity as possible to feed the insatiable growth of their manufacturing capacity. Tesla's become the most efficient auto manufacturer in the world and is scaling the fastest with the least capital outlay. Now, in the next year or two, it looks like they'll do the same with battery cells. After that, raw materials. 
As a side note, several lithium projects, like the Salton Sea projects, are claiming that they can provide all the lithium or most of the lithium required to electrify the United States. I don't buy that. Yet. My guess is there's a certain point where the lithium brine gets depleted of lithium to the point where it becomes uneconomical to extract. Or, in the case of clay, it becomes environmentally disastrous to process that much clay in a given area. However, that's just a guess, and it's something I need to look into. Moving along, let's reorganize the list of 10 strategy points laid out in the order of the script to this, which will form a narrative arc that runs from the basic tenets of Tesla's strategy and plucking the low-hanging fruit to the more ambitious and aggressive. Point number one. If we're to rebuild the entire global economy around sustainable energy, it means that the materials used to build that sustainable future must be extracted in ways that minimize CO2 emissions. Whereas the fossil fuel economy was energy intensive, the sustainable energy economy will be mineral intensive. For example, fossil fuels have an energy density 50 times that of an average lithium ion battery cell. A battery cell instead uses hundreds of pounds of minerals to store energy generated elsewhere. And on the generation side, for example, an onshore wind turbine requires nine times more mineral resources than a gas-fired power plant per kilowatt of generation. But, of course, the minerals used in battery packs are infinitely recyclable. Which brings us to point number two. Batteries are essentially a high-grade battery ore. Tesla will recycle as much material as they possibly can, which will minimize CO2 emissions from mining, reduce the amount of mining they need to do to transition the world to sustainable energy, make the most of every gram of material that runs through their battery factories, and reduce costs. Point number three. Tesla will create a battery supply chain that bypasses China for two reasons. First, if Tesla doesn't do this, China will have a disproportionate influence on Tesla. Second, locally sourced materials will reduce CO2 emissions from shipping and logistics. Third, China uses a lot of coal-fired power, whereas Tesla will push their supply chain to use batteries and solar, or possibly even Tesla batteries and solar. To create the battery material supply chain outside of China, Tesla can use basic supply deals or streaming deals to lock in the materials they need from the mines. However, the raw material will still need to be refined. Tesla could initially run the mined material through Chinese factories, but ideally we'll see Tesla build their own local refining capacity or encourage local companies to build refining capacity to bypass Chinese mercantilism. Point number four, Tesla has stated that they'll use a diversified cathode strategy, and I don't think that what we saw at Battery Day is the end of it. Roughly 50% of Tesla's new vehicles now use lithium iron phosphate batteries because Tesla was seeing potential nickel shortages. If lithium iron phosphate runs into phosphate issues, Tesla can look to a chemistry that uses more manganese. If lithium runs into severe shortages in the middle of the decade, Tesla can switch to sodium ion batteries, which should be hitting the mainstream around 2025. On the anode side, Tesla can use graphite or silicon depending on the use case. Graphite for long life applications and silicon for high energy applications. The different cell chemistry options lead nicely into point number five, which is that Tesla has been buying and will continue to buy every battery cell from every manufacturer that can meet their requirements. This is the lowest effort way for Tesla to acquire battery cells, and of course by proxy, battery materials. However, there is a fish hook here. Due to the fact that China has a near monopoly on battery materials, purchasing battery cells through companies like LG Chem and Panasonic still leaves Tesla vulnerable to China. However, China may lose some of their monopoly power in the next few years. Although I do expect China to maintain dominance in battery materials, we're seeing pushback from lawmakers in both the US and Europe. Earlier, I mentioned the carbon tariff in Europe. Although this could affect Tesla, it's primarily targeted at China and will make it more difficult for China to compete in European markets. Besides trying to slow down the Chinese competition, Europe is also looking to give their own battery material supply chain a boost by increasing their domestic mining, refining, and cathode production capacity. In the U.S., the Defense Production Act will provide funding for locally sourced materials from the U.S. and Canada. And the Pentagon is asking Congress to extend that funding beyond the U.S. and Canada to our English-speaking cousins in Australia and the U.K. 
That is, although Tesla's external battery supply is vulnerable at the moment to the whims of the Chinese Communist Party and geopolitical showdowns, over time, as Tesla's supply chain grows and local supply chains are fostered in the US and Europe, this should become less of a concern. So my view is that Tesla will continue to ramp external cell supply as aggressively as they can. For point number 6 through 10, a bit of background is required. Tesla typically works with the largest battery material suppliers in the world, such as Ganfeng and Albemarle. However, those suppliers can't continue to ramp at the pace that Tesla needs materials. That means Tesla will need to start making increasingly bold moves and will start throwing its weight around in the market. Up until now, Tesla's been struggling to become one of the big boys of the global economy. But they're now in a position where they're so large and growing so fast that they need to be more aggressive and behave more like a power player. Of course, one of the rules of power is that you always use the minimum force necessary to achieve your goals, which is why I've structured this battery materials strategy in a way that's increasingly ambitious as we work down the list. As a final note for points 6 through 10, where applicable, and as Tesla's laid out in their impact reports, they'll be closely monitoring the supply chain and, where possible, dealing directly with the miners and refiners to cut out any middlemen. This will allow them to improve the oversight of their supply chain as it expands. Point number 6 and 7 involve Tesla gently extending their hand to shape the battery materials ecosystem. For number six, with a venture capital approach, simply by attaching their name to a project, the project will get the funding it needs in the open market. In return, Tesla locks in supply and can encourage the development of clean resources in good jurisdictions. For number seven, the example we used was Vale Nickel out of Canada. Vale currently only provides 5% of their nickel to the battery industry. According to the rumors, Tesla may now start drawing an increasing proportion of Vale's nickel supply into their cathode production facilities. I'll be interested to see what proportion of that supply is new, what proportion is going to Tesla, and how it affects the price of stainless steel for the Starship and Cybertruck. In point number eight, we see Tesla taking a bigger risk and making bigger moves. The laterite mines in the Asia Pacific have a reputation for high CO2 emissions, safety issues, and toxic waste issues. It's risky for Tesla to associate closely with those mines. However, the risk is also an opportunity. Tesla can push the mines to cut over to solar power from coal power, improve safety standards, throw engineers at their mining and refining operations to leverage new or better processes and technology, and fully vertically integrate mining, refining, and cell production near the mines. In point number nine, the gloves come off. Tesla starts buying controlling assets in mining and refining capacity to feed their growth. This would pose a public relations risk and may take a large capital outlay from Tesla. I think this could only work if the company Tesla works with has an organizational culture that complements Tesla's and a mining and or refining process that's relatively clean. I'd like to see Tesla purchase Albemarle to get 100% of their production, but it may not work from a cultural or environmental standpoint. However, there are several companies developing geothermal lithium brines around the Salton Sea. If one of them has a culture that jives with Tesla's organizational culture and the project is technically and economically viable, which is yet to be seen, it might be a good match for Tesla. Some of those projects intend to run off existing geothermal operations and leverage direct lithium extraction techniques that are less invasive than mining. Plus, the Salton Sea locals want the projects to succeed, so any permitting required is more likely to go smoothly. The Salton Sea area is already an environmental disaster, so there could be an opportunity for Tesla or the geothermal lithium companies to invest money in the area to rejuvenate it. And, of course, the Salton Sea projects produce geothermal power, which accelerates the world's transition to sustainable energy. So, unlike the nickel mines in Indonesia, Tesla might be more willing to attach their name to a geothermal project due to the lower reputational risks. Note, this is not me vouching for the Salton Sea geothermal projects. I'm skeptical that, as they've claimed, they'll be pumping out tens of thousands of tons of lithium carbonate equivalent within two years. Extracting lithium from these geothermal brines is one of the most difficult challenges in the lithium industry today, and there's a briar patch of patents to navigate. It's also not me saying they'll fail but rather that the timelines are ambitious and it's difficult bringing a new lithium extraction process online and to do it in an economically viable way. 
Point number 10, Tesla goes all in. Despite cracking the whip on every miner and refiner in the world, the battery materials supply just isn't ramping fast enough. I think this will happen in the late 2020s. The most obvious place for this to occur is with a fully vertically integrated clay mine in Nevada where the material is mined, concentrated, and refined on site. As a moonshot here, and this would be quite the moonshot, what if Tesla found a way to economically extract lithium from seawater? Although this is very unlikely given the low concentration of lithium in seawater, I'm throwing it out there to expand your minds to the possibilities. Lithium is everywhere. The limitations are permitting and an extraction technique that's economically viable. The largest potential resource and with the lowest potential impact is lithium in seawater. Finally, as I said at the beginning of the video, this video was focused on strategy. There are two tactical points worth mentioning from Tesla's Q1 2022 earnings call that I covered in the last video. First, Drew Baglino may have hinted that Tesla might start making the industrial equipment necessary for refining lithium. This tactical advantage could be applied to strategy points 6 through 10. Not only that, if Tesla begins making their own lithium refining equipment and that technology is superior to other alternatives on the market, it could open up new resources that were previously not economically viable. I'm wondering if this is what Drew was referring to in the earnings call when he said that we'll have some exciting announcements in the months to come. Second, Tesla can expand their current supply chain that runs through multiple countries like Australia and China. Tesla is monitoring that supply chain closely and pushing their counterparties to expand as quickly as possible. For me, again, this is tactics. It's spreadsheets, site visits, and discussions to leverage existing relationships. It will open up supply for Tesla, but not the 20 to 40 times increase in supply Tesla will need in the next 10 to 20 years. From an investor standpoint, where do we currently stand? As usual, this isn't investing advice, but rather it's my best attempt at reading the tea leaves. For Tesla's two key battery materials, lithium and nickel, it looks like they're set up for a pretty solid materials ramp between now and 2024, maybe 2025. In the past few months, I have said they look solid through 2023, maybe 2024. However, with the new information coming out of Tesla's last earnings call, Elon's tweets, and the agreements Tesla's been teasing, and the agreements that are rumored, I'm feeling more confident in a 50% growth rate until 2024 to 2025. I still have a lot of other questions about battery materials like copper, phosphates, and the other half dozen materials that go into batteries, but lithium and nickel were the challenges that loomed the largest in my mind in the short term and medium term, respectively. However, it still appears that from 2025 and beyond, a 50% growth rate will be increasingly difficult to sustain. And again, I'm viewing this from a permitting perspective. I don't doubt Tesla's technical ability to get things done. With that said, beyond 2025, I'm optimistic that the momentum we're seeing in the US and Europe with lawmakers and national security appendages will grow, and that Tesla will be able to continue to build out their battery materials runway. Note that I'm saying Tesla here. I don't know how legacy manufacturers will weather this storm. China has been focused on their entire raw material supply chain for decades, and they have a high probability of securing all the raw materials they need. As for Europe, VW appears to be the most well-positioned. They have plans to move upstream and they're signing agreements with the likes of Northvolt. However, VW is still years behind Tesla with their cell production plans, let alone their battery materials supply chain. As for all the other legacy auto OEMs, they're making moves, but it may be too little too late. I'm sure many will survive, but many more may be a shadow of their former selves. A good place to hide in the U.S. auto market is pickup trucks, and we might see major U.S. OEMs relegated to making trucks and trucks only, and that might be after a bailout. That's all my opinion, and your guess is as good as mine. Let me know in the comments below. Regardless, the future is bright for Tesla, and I share Elon's sentiment from the last earnings call, which was, quote, I've never been more optimistic or excited about Tesla's future than I am right now, end quote. For the entire time I've followed Tesla, there's been a number of exceedingly difficult challenges on their path to transitioning the world to sustainable energy. As soon as the chip shortages are resolved later this year, and if raw materials pan out as I've speculated here, 
Tesla's really going to let it rip in the next two to three years and ramp to five to six million vehicles a year by 2025, while at the same time massively ramping their energy storage business to rival the vehicle business. And from 2025 onwards, Tesla will do whatever it takes to transition the world to sustainable energy and to maintain their exponential growth rate. Whether that means developing technology, buying a company like Albemarle, or even becoming a miner and refiner themselves. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting me on Patreon with the link at the end of the video, or as a YouTube member. You can find the details in the description. A special thanks to Crafty Geek, Espen Tutting, Armand Vervak, Randy Kirk, author of The Musk Method, Christopher Rubicam, Dan Foro Daniels, Paul Stoller, Mike Baker from Battlesbridge UK, and Hans for your generous support of the channel, my YouTube members, and all the other patrons listed in the credits. I appreciate all your support, and thanks for tuning in.